Hey guys, we are back with another one of CCA's interview, which is part of our outreach series. For those who don't know, my name is Aaliyah. I am a CCA intern and a junior at St. Peter's University in Jersey City, New Jersey. I am majoring in biology, aspiring to become a cranial facial surgeon. I too was born with a facial difference called Golden Heart Syndrome that came with a long road of surgeries, therapies, and a lot of rehabilitation. Which you guys already know, it never stopped me from achieving any of my goals. So today, guys, we have a special guest. I am joined today with Dr. Bartlett, aka like the famous cranial facial surgeon in the game. <laughs> he is my surgeon as well. Dr. Bartlett is and a surgeon in the Division of Plastic, Reconstructive, and Oral Surgery, and director of the Cranial Facial Program at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Thank you so much for having you. Oh my God, Dr. Barley, how are you today? I'm good, Aaliyah. It's great to be on your, uh, your broadcast here, and uh, really great to see you uh, excelling as you are. Thank you, thank you, guys. You guys don't understand, like, me and Dr. Barley go way back. Like he has been work he has worked on me for like since I was like a baby. So like it, this is incredible for me to like interview someone that like really helped with my journey and everything. So I just want to say thank you, Dr. Bartlett. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure taking care of both you and you've got two great parents who really support you, which is really important. Yeah. And uh, you know, we've known each other for a long, long time. Yeah, 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 it has been. Okay, let's get into it. Okay, tell us about yourself and explain your profession to those who don't know what a cranial facial surgeon is. Yeah, so um, I've been doing this for about 35 years and a cranial facial surgeon um, uh, is a surgeon who does mostly uh, surgery of the cranial facial region, mostly for children were born with differences in their in their bones and soft tissues. We as craniofacial surgeons also handle uh, acquired deformities, so something uh, such as a, an injury, uh, facial fracture, motor vehicle accident, bad facial injuries that require putting the face back together. So uh, we we deal from all the way from the top of the skull to the bottom of the the neck, and all of the facial things uh, that have to do with both function and appearance of the face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you say you've been a craniofacial for how many years? Well, I've been here at CHOP for 35 years. So yeah. my journey before that is that um, we all used to have to do general surgery training. So after medical school, five years of general surgery training, and then I did two years of research and then two years of plastics and a year of fellowship in craniofacial surgery. So 11 years after medical school of training uh, before I became a, a staff craniofacial surgeon here at the Children's Hospital. Well, that's incredible. I don't know if I ever mentioned, I did mention to you that I did want to work at CHOP and work in the medical field, but I don't think I ever mentioned to you that I now I want to become a craniofacial surgeon like you. So my question is, what inspired you to become a craniofacial surgeon? That's an interesting story because when I was training in, in uh, general surgery, which is everything, you know, head and neck surgery, abdominal surgery, uh, extremity surgery, I was always drawn to the, the cases that involved the face. Mm. So um, for some reason, I, I liked the anatomy. I liked the uh, physiology of the face, uh, all the functions. The face is very complex, obviously. It holds uh, your eye sockets, your your uh, seeing apparatus, your hearing apparatus, your breathing apparatus, your chewing and eating apparatus. So it's a, a very complicated area mm -hmm. with a lot of different uh, moving parts. And so I found it very interesting just uh, thinking of the anatomy and how one could fix it. And the other part of it is that uh, not only is it a functional part of your body, but it's a, a very important visual part of your body because yeah. people recognize you by your face uh, and they recognize you by your voice. Uh, yeah. So that uh, it's, it marries uh, both aesthetics and functional things very well and it's very challenging. And that's right. why I chose craniofacial surgery after this looking at all other different parts of the body and it seemed the right fit for me. 
Right, right, right. And you both, you work with children and adults, right? Correct. Yeah, I work with children and adults. So all of us who could become craniofacial surgeons first do general plastic surgery, where it's, uh, uh, when, when I was in training, it was two years. Now it's three years of general plastic surgery, where you learn facial reconstruction and aesthetic surgery, but also body, breast, abdomen, extremity surgery. So you have to do that before you do just specialization in facial surgery. And I do it, as you said, children and adults, but it's pretty much all head and neck thing. So it's in yeah. adults, it's things such as uh, fractures of the face and things like that, but also uh, deformities of the face after cancer removal, skin cancer removal. And some of our kids that have had facial deformities since birth, mm -hmm. uh, they need to be have some residual fine things done, fine tuning things done when they be, get to be adults and young adults, 20s to 30s. So I take care of them on the adult side. Yeah, it's funny, guys. This is called, you said the adult side. I'm still on the children's side because, like, I love children. <laughs> I love chop. It was it's funny because my mom always makes fun of me. She's like, oh yeah, I don't understand why you go to chop. You're supposed to be at U Penn. I'm like, I like chop. Like, it's, right. It's how I grew up. So I like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Funny you mentioned that because a lot of kids um, feel like you do, meaning that, or your parents do, that you know she's now a, an adult and she's to be done treated at an adult hospital. But many of our kids don't want to leave chop. Yeah. They don't want to go to. A, children at adult hospitals where everything's new and different you know many of our kids leave here when they're finally finished when they've had their last facial surgery and they're on their way i can feel many of i experienced many of them walking around the room saying goodbye to us all and crying because we've been their home for the yeah. last 18 20 years you know they're home away from home yeah yeah and i remember a bunch of times like when i had surgery when I was like on the like verge of going home after the surgery, I used to go to like all my like uh, different departments for like, cause when um when you guys have when we have surgeries um we have to go to the different departments so like the oral department uh ophthalmology department so I remember going to every department and telling each doctor like oh my god thank you so much like I miss you guys like after the surgery like thank you like saying like thank you. And they're like, oh, Lee, you're so sweet. And like, you basically said CHOP was a home for everyone. And it basically was a home for me. So I really, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it is it is really a second home. And we, we actually take care of children here up until they're about age 26, because well, when children go into college or graduate school, uh, they're frequently remain on their, their parents' insurance plan mm -hmm. uh, until they're 26 uh when they're in college yeah so that's will be you and a lot of it so we therefore use that as a cutoff that we can still take care of them because they're still under the insurance plan of their parents right and, and that and it separates them and and for many reasons you know there's many patients after age 18 or 20 that need final touch-up surgeries or things age a little or shift a little and they need to find a touch-up surgery and to ask them to go get a new doctor at another hospital would be really hard because they'd have to relearn the system that they don't, they don't know the doctor the doctor doesn't know them so we want to get them all the way through exactly. you know until they're young adults until their things are finished so we don't need anything else before we let them go to the right, adults. Right. quick question say like you know i get tired of chop which i never will and i get transferred to UPenn. i will still see you right the right. same doctor Yes. Okay. Yeah. No. Not. Not all of the systems work that way. If you're, I think there's uh, in other parts of the country they may or may not have that arrangement. But most uh, adult hospitals now for for patients that are similar to you that are on the cusp of adulthood may be wondering, well, where are they going to get their care when they become adults? And and mm -hmm. most often uh, many hospitals have adult craniofacial programs or at least some access to people who are experienced on the adult side with craniofacial conditions. So you shouldn't feel alone. You know, there are people out there on the adult side to help you out once you transition out of the pediatric space. Right, 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 right. So as I mentioned, I too want to become a craniofacial surgeon in the future in the long run. So my question is, what was the hardest part 
like for your journey of becoming a craniofacial like what was the part like hardest part for like in medical school or residency like what was the hardest part of your journey yeah you know it's interesting um they were all hard mm -hmm. but they were all easy and and let me explain now excuse me <laughs> so so in medical school we would it was, we frequently had to work. You'd have to stay up to study all night for exams and prepare for exams. And you spent hours and hours and hours preparing for exams. Mm -hmm. But it was, so it was hard to do, but it was easy because I was learning something new and it was exciting right. because you're always learning something new. In residency, it was the same story that mm -hmm. we were frequently on call. Where I was in general surgery, we were on call in the hospital every other night. And right. every other weekend you were on call and you're up frequently up all night working sometimes 18 hours 20 or, or 36 hours in a row but the people you worked with were really fabulous people really bright driven energetic people so mm -hmm. although it was really really hard it was mm -hmm. really really fun because these were really bright people that worked as a team right. so and then the same thing with plastic surgery residency and fellowship you spend yeah. a lot of hours and so forth, and it's a lot of work physically, but you're learning so much and you've got all these new things to explore and challenges and things. And and none of it was a trial. And if I had to do it all over again, I would do it all over again. You know, I really would. Yeah, because of the experience, it's so much fun. You, you learn new things since now, like technology is getting, you know, much better now. So like, it's so much else to learn. So I'm yeah. excited for medical school right now. I'm like currently in my, I think I told you, I'm in my junior year at St. Peter's. So this is a time like I'm starting to look at like medical schools and all this stuff. Like what's it called? I think my top school right as of right now is um, University of Sciences in Philadelphia. It's called St. Mm -hmm. John's now, but I don't know. I'm still looking still. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a long road. I mean, you know, if somebody's interested, if any of your viewers are interested in this, they yeah. they have to start out by, you know, going to a, a really solid college and getting a solid preparation yeah. and then move on to medical school and then on to residency and then on to fellowship, you know, and it's a, it's a long, long uphill battle, but it's, at least for me, it's been worth it. And I think everybody who's gone through it feels like it's worth it. It is worth it because you're doing what you love. So yeah, it is worth it. Yeah, and I think that one of the other things that I would mention to you earlier that's special about pediatric plastic surgery, craniofacial surgery, we get to see little kids when they're this big, you know, yeah. and then when they're this this big, you know. So we we grow up with them, you know. Yeah. Uh, we watch them grow up, and it's really really exciting to see somebody come into our program as a baby with a major problem, and then finally leave as an adult when everything is corrected as best it can be. And it's really satisfying for both us and the and the patients. Yeah, exactly. Like for me, like I was there since I was, I don't even know how old, but like, I remember being so shy, not even like responding to people, not even looking at like you. I don't remember if I even talked to you when I was younger, like I was so shy. Like I was never comfortable with myself and all that stuff. But like as you grow up, you know, starting to realize like, okay, this is how I look. I gotta accept it. Like this is me, you know. And now to come to this point to be like on an interview call with you and like interviewing you for the work. Yeah, you who would have thought this when you were in first grade, right? Exactly, it's crazy. I would never, and I love it because now I'm a voice for others that is going through the same situation. So yeah, I yeah. love it. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Since you are a well-known surgeon, like, what's it called? I had, like, so many other guests on here that said, like, they, um, that you were their doctor. Wesley? Mary and Wesley? Yes, yes. Yes. From the Carolinas. Yep. <laughs> yes, I just did an interview with them, and, um, I don't know if you know, like, I started vlogging, like, YouTube stuff. Like, every time I go to, I have a doctor's appointment, I chat with you or anyone else, I vlog my whole experience. And I posted on social media and everyone loved it. And that's where I found um, Mary and Wesley. And they're like, oh my God, we have Dr. Bartlett too. Oh my God. It's yeah, like they're, yeah, they're really incredible. They came to me um, 
after they'd had early surgery elsewhere in Florida, I believe, was their original surgery, but they lived in the Carolinas and then they need some secondary surgery, complicated stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, that wasn't easy, but they're, they're great. And they're an example of someone who's sort of come through and finished the program and are now both, you know, happy, successful adults, you know, yeah. young adults. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy because I never met anyone that had the same doctor as me. So I was like, oh my God, you have Dr. Barley? Isn't he the best doctor ever? He made, he created this. Isn't this crazy? Like, yeah, yeah. So my question is, since you are like a well emotional surgeon, how do you have time for yourself? Like, you know, manage time for yourself, like when you're off? Yeah, that's, that's a very, that's a very tough one. Because I probably don't do it as well as I should, you know. I think time management is always a problem for for everybody, you know. Uh, and I probably don't do it as well as I I should. Um, uh, I try to uh, at least get to the gym every day, you know, and and that's important. And more and more, more and more on the weekends, I'm trying to shut off from, you know, having to do things medical. But pretty much every day when you're taking care of patients, things come up, you know, patients have questions, emergencies come up and things. So you, it's very hard to shut off, but yeah. uh, you know, I think time management is a problem. I, I wish I had an answer for it, yeah. you know, because uh, I think you, you just have to, you just have to set aside a certain part of every day for something you like to do. For right. me, it's getting to the gym in the evening and also reading books before I go to bed. And taking my dog for a walk, you know, and then seeing my wife, obviously. But it's really hard. It's really hard for um, our fellow, our current fellow. Um, you know, he's got a wife and two young children. It's really hard for him because of the family commitments as well. Just the time commitments are really hard. If you're going to be a doctor uh, of any type, mm -hmm. and but especially if you're going to be someone who's going to take on facial trauma and, and be available for emergencies your family's your family's gonna do some things without you occasionally you know they'll just they're it's just gonna happen you know because if you're serious about being a doctor and really helping people with facial traumatic injuries and things like that it's gonna yeah. take you away from your family occasionally to to, yeah. to take care of people that are in need and you right. just have to you just have to know that going in and if you don't, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that type of medicine. Right, 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 right. Because I'm thinking about my future. I've been, what's it called? I've been thinking about my future since well, senior year of high school, and thinking about the medical track. I'm like, okay, this is this is a long road, but like, I love it. It's gonna be worth it. But then I think about like, okay, boom. Once I'm a cranial facial surgeon. How am I gonna like you know balance things that you know I like to do when I'm you know, off? And, like how am I gonna do that? So hearing that from you really helped a lot. So now I can. Like yeah. You know it's interesting. I think it's a little easier to balance things now because we've got a little some time saving tools like an electronic medical record. We used to have to look through old yeah. charts and spend endless hours looking through charts to find information. Right. So in electronic me medical records, we also have, uh, I, we, I work with some exceptional nurse practitioners and PAs, you know, that help with office hours yeah. and uh, patient care. And the other thing is that, that I didn't have, which is going to be easier for the next generation, which is very time saving, mm -hmm. is really to look up anything you want online mm -hmm. very easily. You know, if you have a question you don't know the answer to, it's very easy to get it through the library resources or through Google or whatever it takes to get that information. So yeah. those technological advances have made it a little bit easier and less time consuming. It, it like makes it easier for me to get what I need and spend less time doing it. So it frees up some time for other things. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. And you said you like to, on your free time, you like to go to the gym? Yeah, yeah, I usually try to get there every day. And uh, I also, um, yeah, in the winter, I um, ski if I can. In the summer, I fish a lot on the weekends. Oh. Yes. So I think everybody everybody that I know has some sort of hobby that they have that they're passionate about. Yeah. And I think I think they uh, most people I know are passionate about something, whether it's golf or whether it's tennis or whether it's 
fishing or whether it's um, uh, uh, other activities, you know, you have to have something to fill that void. You, you can't not have that. I think the biggest, the hardest part for us in medicine, at least for me in medicine, is we're indoors every day, all day, you know, and it's, uh, I'd do anything to be outdoors, you know, and be outside. Yeah, what's what's your um typical day like? Like what what time do you start, you know, work like? Yeah. So I usually get up around five or five fifteen. Um I usually uh have to take the dog out for a little bit in the morning and uh and then uh, have some coffee and then head off to work. And then usually uh the things I have to catch up in the office, emails, papers, yeah. whatever. And then my typical day is uh, working in either the clinic or the OR from seven or eight in the morning till four, five, or six in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then uh, usually you have to go back to the office and clean up emails or talk to the research fellows because mm -hmm. we write papers and things like that. And then usually, out, hopefully, out of there by seven, sometimes eight at night. Sometimes I'll get to the gym till eight or nine, wow. have a late dinner read and go to bed so it's they're pretty long days even after 35 years of doing this is that, your late, is that like your typical time you get yeah that's a, that's a typical day now on the weekends uh, occasionally i'm on call occasionally but usually uh i don't have those demands i'll do something more fun go yeah. outside but usually each weekend i have to allocate at least four hours to catching up on things Right. That you need to do if you're going to write papers or teach residents or prepare lectures. I don't have enough hours during the, the week, so I have to do it on the weekends. Mm -hmm. but I think most people do have some activity on the weekend for their job and if they're working medicine. Yeah. Right. You, you say you have a dog. What kind of dog you have? I have a little Bichon Poodle mix that I bring. Very, very cute. Very energetic. And uh, I... Um, I, uh, that's one of the things probably that is most stabilizing in my life because every night I take him for a walk before I go to bed, you know, every night, you know, it's usually at nine o'clock, maybe a little later, but every night he gets a walk and, you know, it's important for him and it's important for me, you know, and I know several, several of my friends who do the same thing, you know, they have a dog or somebody like that, that they, you know, they, they spend, you know, uh, some relaxation time with every day. Right. I feel like dogs help so much. Like I know for myself and especially for my dad, like you said, like just going for the walk is like, it's good to clear the mind and just to go for a walk with your dog. Cause a dog is like your best friend. I, I had like yeah, a, dog, a dog is unconditional love. And, you know, we have, we have several patients, uh, in our, in our craniofacial clinic, who have service dogs, yeah. you know, they come in, come in with their service dogs to the clinic, you know, yeah. uh, uh, or therapy dogs uh, or whatever, you know, that a dog for them is a very, very essential part of mm -hmm. their, their life. Not only their, uh, just for the fun that they bring, but their psychological benefit of having that dog there. Right, right. I have a, a good friend. You you most definitely have to remember her. You worked with her before. Her name is um Emily Merrill. Yes, of course. Yes. Oh my god. Um I connected with her last year and she was like one of my first guests on this series. And we just grew and our, our relationship is so strong right now, but like yeah, like on her um, social media page, that's what she um, influences. And she teaches us um, why and like how she needs to service dogs and like what it does and like everything about it, which is very important. Cause like people don't know like the real, like, you know, the truth of why we, um, why others need service dogs. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool to hear her side of her story and watch her journey on social media. So. Yeah. That's great. There. I know she. I know she does have a service dog, and I, I met him. I'm trying to remember his um, name. Do you remember? I know her service dog now is Murphy. The other one? Oh, Hank. Hank. Yeah. Hank. Yeah. Hank. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you got a better memory than I do for that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's uh, you know, and that's uh, you know, that's that's a great thing about dogs is you know, as I said, they're 
they're unconditional in their love for you. And they, you know, they, um, they don't see facial differences in any way as negative, you know? Nothing, nothing. They, they have a way of, they, they love you, whether you're, you know, whether your hair is short, whether your hair is long, whether your skin's white, whether it's black, whether you're tall, whether you're short, yeah. whether you're heavy, whether you're thin, your dogs have this unconditional love for you that uh, I hope that uh, people who haven't had the pleasure of having dogs and sharing time with animals would at least give it a try. Yeah, it really is a different type of love. I can't even express it enough. So I know you meet with a lot of patients, including me. Um, obviously you said like so many like every time I mentioned a patient you knew right from the back who they were and all this so do you share a special connection with each of your patients since you worked in a challenging but amazing field yeah I mean it depends on obviously I have a, a long-term connection with many of them because uh, you know for some things they're isolated problems like they've got a broken bone in their face and they fix it and they heal I don't see them again because that's not likely to be in, if they're an adult or young adult because it's not likely to be a problem. But mm -hmm. the kids that I've that I've seen when they're babies and I know that they're going to need one procedure at this age and then it's only going to get them this far. They're going to need another procedure at this age. It's only going to get them this far. Then another procedure. Those kids that I've known for long term, I of course I remember almost every one of them. You know. And yeah. I may not remember every single thing about them and what we did, yeah. uh, specifically, but I remember generally a lot about them uh, just because I've, I've seen them over and over, time and time again. You have to study them. Yeah. But I was like, every time I used to go to CHOP, like, this is a time, like, I, did, I hated going to the hospital. I'm like, oh, we're here again. What are they going to do now? Like, what is the only thing they knew? So I was like, oh, like, seeing you, I was like, I'm going to see him every time. And I'm, I'm thinking, like, oh, like, he's not going to remember me. He's, you know, I was yeah. like, you know, but, like, every time you came in, you're like, hey, Leo, what's up? And then we always used to, like, talk about pole vaulting or anything. That yeah, right, right. So, so I, I, I still, I remember you especially because um, some of the, some of the pictures I take, took when we did your, one of your early procedures on, your left side of your face when we took the rib. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I have pictures of that that were taken that, that I've used over the years in the talk to educate medical people, you know? Really? So, yeah. So I remember, I particularly remember you and I remember some of my other patients the same way because we've used their, their x-rays and their, their interoperative pictures and things to teach other people. So like you're, some of your pictures of your jaw surgery and stuff when you were younger, the first jaw surgery you had, I've used in talks over and over. Yeah. Oh my God, they, can't tell, they can't tell it's you because oh. it's, you know, it's, oh. it's hidden oh. in such a way, yeah. but, uh, but I've used it. So I, re I remember who it is. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, wait, I, I would love to see those photos if you don't mind. Yeah. At some point I'll be happy to show them to you. I love I love looking at any x-rays like I love like you said like you love the anatomy and all that I love all that stuff so I also noticed that you work very closely with CCA for quite some time what is your partnership with CCA entail so it's interesting uh I was around when CCA was founded uh in Dallas in yeah. the early part of uh this must have been probably late 80s early 90s um, yeah. And then it's gone through some leadership transitions and so forth. But uh, we've had a long involvement with CCA. Uh, one of our uh, former coordinators, Diana Sweeney, uh, would every year uh, we'd raise money and send several of our patients to the retreat that CCA has yeah. every year. Um, they've been they've met in Florida and Texas and California, all over the United States, and so. We've been actively involved with CCA since the very beginning and uh, try to support it as much as we can uh, yeah. because I think it's really good for families um, because when they get together at a CCA retreat and all the other kids can realize, hey, there's uh, there's a lot of people that are just like me right. or they can finally meet somebody that they may have been on a chat room with or with a, you know, uh, or some other way of communicating with someone and finally make a 
face-to-face -face encounter and meet that person has been has been I think a great thing that the CCA retreat does. Yeah, what's it called? It's crazy that you said that because ever since um, I interned for CCA, I met so many people that look just like me. And it's crazy. I never met anyone ever in my life that has a difference or um, disability. So it's pretty cool to make have new connections in my life. So I am like through the roof. Like I'm so excited to see like my other community. Like I call them my family because like they are my family. And to actually meet the people that I'm, I spoke with um, on the series face to face, I think that's that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. It's very cool. They are, they do become your family, and they they are. It is great to see them face to face after yeah. so many years. Right, and I didn't even know that. It's crazy. My last question for you, Dr. Bartlett, is what advice would you offer someone like me or anyone else? who is considering trying to become a surgeon in their life? Yeah, I think you've got to re realize that it, it comes with a lot of sacrifice, meaning you're, you're going to have to give up a lot of things, um, uh, work harder than your peers would. You're just going to be expected of you. You're going to be on call. You're going to be on night studying. And so you've, you've got to be willing uh, to give that up and, and really put your best foot forward if you're going to succeed. But the advice I would give is that uh, really, if you do that, and if you pursue something like that passionately, it will bring big dividend, big dividends and big rewards in the end. Uh, it is really a fascinating uh, area, and we we need good people, and uh, I think people have been walked that journey and walked in those shoes and have been a craniofacial patient would make great fit craniofacial surgeons. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, my future. Like, I've, like, I've really been working really hard, like, right now, like, I've been, like, putting myself out there, like, with CCA, like, I put myself out there to get, um, get new connections and everything. So I'm pretty excited. And to, I, my other goal is to work at CHOP, and because you inspire me to, like, you know, become the person I want to be. So I thank you for that. Well, you're, you're welcome. Yeah. Well, it was, it was great being on with you today. Uh, uh, good luck with everything. Uh, uh, I'll look forward to talking with you again when you come into the office. Yeah, we have a lot to work on with the job. But yeah, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> thank you so much for being on. It has been a pleasure chatting with you today. I will see you again. Take care. Good luck. I'll see you in the next office setting, okay? You will. Yes, we have a lot. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.